This will be available and archived on the ERLC website uh, sometime following the presentation. And so if you know others who'd like to see it or if you'd like to watch it again, it will be there. And as we get more information about that, this will be the first one we've ever sent to the ERLC website. So we'll, we'll keep, uh, try to keep people abreast of where that will be located. I'm going to introduce Susan and she's going to just take a minute to talk very quickly about the PLC and welcome everybody. Hi, my name is Susan Gilbo and I'm one of the members of the Low Incidence Provincial Wide team. And I'm really excited to have Kathy Howery presenting this um, webinar to you today. It is our first of our monthly professional learning community sessions that we are doing this year. And this project is um, something I have been working with Kathy on, not as extensively as she has, but I've been following her through her journey with it. And I think for um, the participants that are in the BVI, the blind, visually impaired world, this will be new information for many of you and exciting information. And the other folks who are joining us, I'm sure you are going to get just as much out of it. So welcome everybody and we'll turn this over to Kathy. Yeah. Great. So you can still hear me all right <coughs> fiddling here. Um, yes? Yeah, we can hear it all, Kathy, okay. including the okay. crashing okay. bangs. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. So, um, so oh, I've got to switch. Welcome, everybody. Um, I thought I would welcome you in a variety of different symbols, seeing we're going to be talking about uh, symbols today. As Susan mentioned, um, this has been something that her and I have been um, thinking about, playing at, working on for a while, and I'm really excited to be able to share um, this information with you about these 3D factual symbols um, that have been developed by Karen Erickson and um, her folks at the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies, and I'll tell you more about that in a bit. Um, and also, um, just to have an opportunity to talk to both SLPs and teachers and um, teachers of the vision visually impaired together, because I think this is a really neat opportunity to understand how much our worlds collide for um, many of our kids, because as, as all of you know, the thing about many kids is that there's some in multiples. So. so, Ross, there's some background noise that's loud. I don't know what that is, but anyway, I maybe... Yeah, I actually thought that was on your end. I'll, nope. I'll hunt and watch more. Not me. Not me. Just me and my sleeping about. puppy here, so thanks. Okay. All right, so here's some uh, con uh, ideas that we're going to do because I, I want to sort of set the stage for why I'm so excited about these um, tactile symbols um, and I want to make sure that um, that people have the, a little bit of background knowledge. I don't want to turn you all into communication consultants or SLPs, but I do want to make sure that we're from the same place. Linda, I wonder if that's your, wonder, there's somebody's mic. Anyway, we'll figure it out. I found out. it, Kathy. I found it. It's done. Thanks. Okay, so um, these are some of the big ideas that we're going to hit on today before I actually show you these symbols. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the world of augmentative and alternative communication um, and have been around for a while like myself, um, you will know that there's lots of changing and emerging, I guess is the better way to say this, understandings that we have in the field that certainly have impact for kids um, who have uh, complex communication needs and vision needs. So back in the day when I first started, um, working with kids with multiple challenges, there was a very strong idea that only some kids were going to be candidates or would benefit from AAC supports, had to demonstrate the, uh, sensory motor level five, and I don't remember all the other things. Today, thankfully, we have recognized that there are no um, cognitive or behavioral or visual or whatever prerequisites for the use of augmentative and alternative communication that all kids communicate and all kids can um, gain uh, more symbolic communication if if we, um, whoops, I keep getting the wrong 
slide, sorry, if we um, give them opportunities to do so. So in the old days, the candidacy model days, you know, oops, what happened? Oh dear, sorry, there, okay. In the candidacy model days, the idea was that really for, for some kids, they were pretty well. Oh, we've lost your screen. You've lost my screen. Something, oh, well, something clicked out here. I had a big, sorry guys, okay. <gasps> Forgot to say the particip uh, the technology prayer. We will have to do that right now. Okay. Are you then we're back, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, hold on. Lost it again. What's there? Okay. So I'm going to there. All right. Yeah. Okay. Technology prayer. Everybody say it. All right. So, you know, people with blank will never be able to blank. Um, but now we recognize that given the appropriate um, education tools, and then we have some more, I guess, sim, sim tools in our symbol toolkit as of today, supports and service that all kids can learn to use AAC to expand their communicative abilities. So the idea around this is uh, presumed competence. And any of you have heard me talk before or or Karen Erickson, or Linda, um, uh, Linda Burkhart, or uh, Carolyn Muslite um, have all heard that really what we have to be doing is not assuming that kids can't or they're not ready or whatever, that really we want to assume that it's our job to make sure that we give them every opportunity and that we believe that they can. And that they're sort of changing standing in the a world of AAC is that when we start at AAC, what we really should be doing is focusing on choice making and requesting when, um, and certainly, my goodness, I used to have kids make choices between something they liked and a stinky sock, which um, is something, but I don't know if it's communication. But anyway, um, today we have a much better understanding that what we have to do is not put the child into responding, requesting mode, but actually talk with and to children and make sure that they have opportunities for all of the pragmatic functions of language, which is, this is really important foundational stuff to how we're going to be talking about using these um, tactual symbols. Um, the, um, under the purposeful activity of sharing information across space and time with different people, and it might have take many different um, forms. We all use lots of different ways to communicate. We use speech, we use our bodies, we use sometimes written communication. So the whole idea of having a, a mode other than speech to communicate is something that's real familiar to us, but certainly speech is our primary mode if we are able to do so. But communication doesn't start out purposeful. And this is another really key understanding that we need to think about for our kids with really significant um, either uh, needs in any of any kind is that we don't expect babies to be talking to us for at least 12 months, probably two years. Um, we talk to them incessantly, we bombard them with language, we repeat words, we focus on certain words, and we expect that they will become speakers after that lovely, rich, um, repeated um, stimulation of language. The challenge for lots of our kids who use different kinds of language, so aided language, whether it be pictographic language for kids that perhaps can see or the kind of tactual tools that we're going to be, tactual symbols that we're going to be talking about today is that for a typically developing child, they get that spoken language in, coming in, coming in, and eventually a couple of years of being spoken to and spoken with and spoken about, um, spoken language comes out. Um, for our kids, we tend to give spoken language in and expect them somehow to give us something back in their aided language simulation or aided language system or their, with their different symbols. This, of course, comes from the work of Gail Porter, and many of you will recognize these, um, these slides from uh, other people who talk about Gail's work, particularly in the context of pod training. So what we have to start thinking about for our kids is they not only need spoken language in, if we're going to expect them to use aided language, but they also need to have 
um, access to the symbols as input or as receptive language and have lots and lots of access to those symbols as they're learning them so that they can start to use them as output, just like typically developing kids do. In fact, because our kids make much more um, exposure to symbols as input and as um, receptive language before we would ever be able to expect that they will start to use those symbols um, expressively, which I think is something we haven't done very well um, for a long time. Yep, hello, Louise. Do you have a question? Maybe not. Okay, I, maybe that was just an accident. Okay. Um, Oh, Louise, you have your hand raised. Would you like to ask a question? Do you know how to unmute your mic microphone? Okay, I'm not sure. What's... All right, I'm going to move along. And if I see something come up in the chat, or if you do want to ask a question, um, please do so. The other thing that is a challenge for um, kids with visual impairments who, uh, who also have complex communication needs is the preponderance of symbols that we use in the AAC world are visual. So if you think the uh, picture communication symbols, the um, picture sticks that are used in programs like Prologo, they are um, pictures or um, visual representations of language, which of course for our kids who are have significant visual impairment are very difficult. There are some folks now and more work is being done on providing um, high contrast visual symbols for kids that might have um, CDI or we will have some vision, but still there's a there was a, a there has been a significant I would say gap in terms of our uh, resources to provide symbolic uh, access to language for our kids um, who have more significant visual challenges. All right, now I've got the chat window up. Okay. Um, the other sort of changing understanding, and it definitely has been a changing understanding, is this notion of that there isn't really a symbol hierarchy that we should be using. In fact, I still looked on some websites um, recently and getting ready for this. I still saw lots of websites that say you should start with real objects, then go to photographs before we introduce symbols. Um, and there's absolutely no research to support that. In fact, um, if you were going to do that, if you think about that logically, you wouldn't, you wouldn't speak to a baby about their bottle or about their blanket until they could Tell, show you somehow that they understood what that was. All language um, is, sim oops, is symbolic. That's, oops, eh, dear, I don't know why I'm having such trouble today. Um, a, the primary characteristic of signs or symbols or words is that they are arbitrary and we don't have a direct relationship between the form and the meaning. Perhaps unless as I'm reminded as my dog is barking here, there are a few few words in the English language that have anomatopoeia, so they sound like what they mean, bark, meow, those kinds of words, but mostly there's completely no relationship between the form and the meaning. Yet somehow we have come to this idea that for our um, atypically developing kids that they need to go through this multiple different kinds of learning. Um, recent research is actually showing that this is that getting in the way of them understanding language because they have to learn things over and over and over. So we have lots of research to support that the whole notion of a symbol hierarchy is no longer um, what we think about as best practice. Um, some of the research actually is work research that Karen Erickson has been doing, and I'll talk a little bit about that along the way, but she's um, been doing, and I'll talk specifically about it as we get to the end of this, uh, this talk. Um, she's been doing a bunch of work with kids with significant uh, intellectual disabilities and CCN, and um, they, those kids are making significant progress in their um, understanding of various language forms and their use of various language forms, but 
they keep bumping up against this idea that people still believe that we have to start with concrete reference. There's, there's really no evidence for that. And a really exciting study recently by Snodgrass, Stoner, and Angel um, had a nine-year-old child with multiple disabilities um, being able to use, not only understand, but use three conceptually referenced textual symbols, more done and new in his communi initial communication vocabulary. So the idea that we have to start with a concrete cup to represent cupness, or that we have to start have them making choices about concrete things, um, I think is being more and more um, disproven by the, the um, research, which is exciting. All right. Oops, I think I'm going back. So the idea, whoops, the idea now is rather than having these activity-based choice-making things um, that um, are very contextual dependent and that the words are nouns um, that you could actually point to or that you can um, uh, represent by a concrete reference that the the whole world of augmentative and alternative communication is really moving towards this idea of, um, I guess what I would say is e expanding the use of, and um, I'm searching for a word that's not obviously part of my core vocabulary, but um, making better use of core vocabulary. So what is this core vocabulary of which I speak? 85% of what we say is made up of only 200 words. These are referred to as core vocabulary. And there's lots of research to support this, that um, you know, if, you, if you go with young children's speech, if you go with older people's speech, there are these sort of basic words that make up the most of what we talk about. We tend to do things, uh, and they're not nouns. They tend to be other kinds of words. They tend to be verbs and adjectives and pronouns. So we talk about it or that or this way more than we talk about the stapler or the book or the dog or this computer, or we might say this computer, but we could point to the computer because it's in our environment, we can point to it. So these words are, are very powerful. Um, they are, this, this core is consistent across place and topic, and also is found to be consistent in the research across cognitive ability. So um, small, few words, I've kind of said that already. They consist of some nouns, fewer nouns, mostly verbs, adjectives, adverbs, pronouns, things that give them uh, a great deal of power in terms of talking about uh, lots of different things across lots of different contexts and also great things that gave them a great deal of power for teaching because you have a few words that you can use in all kinds of teaching situations. So I'll give you an example and I'm going to say thanks. Uh, I'll leave that. These, uh, maybe I won't. I shouldn't jump over this. This is representation of core vocabularies in different kinds of AAC systems. But for the SLPs in the world, the whole idea of core vocabulary originally started um, with MinSpeak and the MinSpeak core vocabulary idea um, and recently has been taken up by just about every system that there is out there. So thanks, a shout out to Toby uh, Scott who's in the audience who created the next couple of slides uh, that we used at the summer symposium. But I, I know lots of the vision folks didn't get to get this background so I thought it would be important to do this. So core vocabulary is flexible. If you had uh, the core vocabulary or the symbol for different, you could talk about wanting a different book. You could talk about that you're in, in art class or something. Oh, look, your picture is different than mine. So you could point to that picture, that picture, and say different. So you've got lots of contextual clues. You can use that as a uh, your, show your understanding of dissimilar. Unequal, that number is different than this. So you could talk about it in math class. Um, the difference is five. Strange, he's acting different. Oh, he's, what kind of different behavior is that? So that one word can go across lots of different contexts. Let's think about it again with the word turn. And turn is actually one of the textuals that we have. Um, you can turn the page of the book. So if you're reading, doing some shared reading with a child that has um, significant uh, visual impairment and um, um, 
complex communication needs. We could use the symbol turn to talk about turning the pages. We, in the context of a game or an activity, you could say your turn. Um, and with a toy, I could turn, turn the channel, turn it up, turn it down, turn it off, turn it on, turn the current, tor turn the corner, turn away. So all of the rich meanings of the word turn, the symbol turn, um, can be learned across the context of the day. So you get multiple opportunities to use this core vocabulary in um, multiple activities. Rather than if you had a communication display with, with the activities, book, game, toy, TV, bath, person, um, you might get to talk about a book maybe twice in the day. You might be able to talk about the game during the activity time that you're doing the game. So the thing here is the vocabulary um, is flexible and there's lots of opportunity to practice uh, repetition with variety, which I'll talk about a little bit more too. Um, Karen Erickson's work, some of you, many of you probably are familiar with Karen Erickson's work. What she did is or she and her colleagues at the uh, in North Carolina looked at all, of, not maybe, I don't know about all, many, many, many different studies that looked at um, core vocabulary lists. And they, um, from that, discerned 40 words that they thought would be most useful in school situations. So this core vocabulary list might not be exactly the same core vocabulary list that you would be using with an infant or that you would be using with someone, um, an adult who's in a leisure situation, although I think they would work pretty well. But just to put some context around this, um, they were looking particularly at what would be most useful in the context of school or educational environments. Then interestingly, this is going to maybe confuse a few people, but I'll try and say why there's only 36 now on Karen's pages when we get to the project core. What they did is they field tested it. They took those 40 words and they tried them with a, a variety of teachers in the research. Karen's doing research all over the United States um, with teachers in classrooms where kids have um, significant disabilities, including uh, deaf blind, deafness and blindness. Um, and complex communication needs. And based on that field testing, um, they found, the teacher said, these 36, so they had to make some changes. These are the 36 words that we really find the most useful. They found some words that they didn't use um, a lot, and they found other words that they were missing on the original. And I, somewhere in my list, know which those differences are, but I'm not gonna worry about that today. This is the 36 core that they landed on. Now, I just want to say something about this. Um, these core words and this, these displays of these core words are not meant to, um, in any way, shape, or form, take the place of a more robust language system. If the child has a more robust language system, uh, AAC system, do not put that aside and use the the core vocabulary boards. This is meant to be a real introduction um, for kids that don't have any uh, symbolic representation available to them of these very powerful core vocabulary words. But it's a starting place, not an ending point. And I'll, for those of you who are interested in that, maybe you come and join us in the CCN uh, PLC, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But so uh, anyway, the point of this is that they're powerful words. They can be used in lots of different contexts, and they are to uh, to a large extent um, field tested. Okay, so what about tactile tactile symbols um, for our kids? Um, one of the things, and the the way that I started on this journey with um, was that I was trying to say, okay, we've got a nice set of lots of ways to produce and reproduce and consistently reproduce um, AAC symbols, visual symbols for kids with complex communication needs, kids that need augmentative and alternative communication systems. But what about our kids who are blind? Not the kids that have CVI that we can um, do the um, high contrast symbols, although I'm wondering about that now, but kids that really are blind and, um, or I don't know, Susan, can you be really blind? Sorry, if I say something inappropriate for the 
um, vision world. You'll have to slap me on the wrist afterwards. I'm trying to learn that world too. Um, for kids that have uh, severe or significant visual impairment, how do we represent symbols to them? And many of you, I think, will know that there are tactile symbols that have been produced, um, some by the Texas School for the Blind, and um, those are the ones that I, uh, actually they sent me a whole bunch of symbols based on one teacher's re uh, request for them, and I got quite excited about this, and Susan, I said, Susan, Susan, look at this, we can start to actually um, uh, reproduce symbols and give kids consistent symbols. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to take you to that website for a little minute if you haven't been there um, before. So they have lots of symbols, but if you look at their symbols, they're almost all nouns. So remember what I said about the power of core vocabulary? There are next to no core vocabulary words representations of core vocabulary on this list. You have to go way, so we can do lots of labeling and lots of choice making and lots of scheduling, but to do talking and to do talking across lots of different contexts like we can with core vocabulary, uh, not so much. And I'm going way down to gym symbols, where were they? Miscellaneous. There's a few miscellaneous functor words. And even these um, more, um, and finished would be the only two that would be actually seen as uh, core vocabulary. So huge gap, like while these are exciting and, and I think if one was going to use them for maybe visual schedules or um, giving kids some uh, information, uh, or not visual schedules, for tactual schedules, that kind of information, they might be really useful, but otherwise, if we're thinking about words that have lots of power, um, sadly, they're, they're missing. Um, the other set that I know that's available um, for, I think, $699 are um, from the American, uh, our American Printing House for the Blind. And again, you can see from the look here, lots and lots of nouns and, um, and not very many, if any, uh, core vocabulary. So, um, Oh, and that, here's how you might want to use some of those, but still we're missing the powerful core vocabulary. So one day, and this is exactly how this happened, I was in the school where I um, um, was, where we were thinking about introducing some of the symbols from the, the, the Texas School for the Blind, and I thought, hmm, I think I've heard Karen Erickson talk about this before, so I Skyped her, and she said, wait, Kathy, you should see what we're doing. We're doing this really new project, a really exciting new project, and we're trying to hit on some of the, uh, the challenges around um, tactual symbols for kids, as well as trying to um, think about doing with our core. So there, there you go. Um, ne next thing I, oops, sorry. What is going on with this? My computer has got it there. So, um, so they had been developing and working on, they had some funding for a big new project, which they call Project Core. And you can see it's um, out of the Center for Liter Literacy and Disability Studies at Chapel Hill, where Karen is. And um, the project is all about um, providing, well, the project is bigger than core. The project is about thinking about what are the core vocabulary items that need to be represented on every single uh, system for kids. Then the next piece that they're going to be looking um, to move up is to what will be the, um, if, you, if you think about it kind of in the RTI model, um, what, that these right now are the universal cores. They're going to be starting to look at what are um, the next set of really highly useful symbols and how do we represent them. And then finally, at the top of the cone of symbols, I guess, what are the really specific symbols. But these are the universal core symbols that they have been developing. Um, and their project also, if you want to, sorry, I should go back here, um, is based on some really lovely work by Romsky, uh, Marianne Romsky and Rose Sepkik from 2006. The, some of you who know me will have heard me talking about um, or 19, that book, Breaking the Speech Barrier, and their work with re, uh, kids who are in their uh, middle school and have had no communication systems whatsoever and had learned um, using M-cell, which is uh, modeling of language, um, 
to actually communicate. So uh, the project core has taken those two things together and started this, this project. Now, um, if we get to the universal core systems, one of the beautiful things that they've done here for teachers and pe because they're recognizing that, and Karen tells me, in, North, in rural North Carolina, there are many schools that have, and many kids that have absolutely no communication systems and um, don't have board maker and don't have the, the lovely things that we have to um, reproduce these symbols in a consistent manner. A symbol is only a symbol if you can reproduce it in a consistent manner and understand it that consistently. So that was one of, so what they've done really generously is created lots of different ways for their universal core vocabulary to be represented and presented um, and shared. So you can get the um, 36 core board um, in a variety, you can get it as a PDF. If you don't have uh, BoardMaker, you can get it um, BoardMaker. If you have it, you can get it BoardMaker with high contrast. Um, so lots of different, so for those of you who are working in the world of CVI, it's important to note that they put the high contrast symbols here as well. So this, this board here would be for a child that could directly access and point with their fingers. Um, as we know, many of our kids can't do this. Um, this four page, uh, four on a page layout is for kids that could point, but not um, as clearly or not as um, consistently as to access all 36. Now, don't get confused by these four by four presentations here. You're still always giving all 36 symbols to every child. It's not that you're only giving four and then adding four and then adding four. You're always giving all 36. It's just the different ways that the child can access them. Um, partner assisted. Again, they've got them with the uh, regular, the way you see them there, and then the high contrast. This is for kids that would be using, or that we, who we would be providing an auditory scan. So um, I'm not gonna go into that very much today, but perhaps some of the vision folks and the SLPs um, on, on the meeting would like to actually learn about how to do an auditory scan. Basically, you're, you go through the symbols like want, not, go, do you want one of those? And the child would have a way to indicate yes or no. And if they said yes, you'd go like, and then you'd wait for them to say yes or no, want, yes or no, not, yes or no, go, yes, okay, let's go. Um, and if, if it's none of those, then you move on to the next page. So really it's providing those 36 symbols, but you've got a different access method. Then finally, at the bottom of this page, I'll skip through some of the other ones, are what we were going to be talking about today, which are um, the uh, computer-generated, um, 3D-printed, tactual symbols. Now you see there's not 36 there yet, there's only um, 13, but they're working on it. So they're trying to figure out how these symbols will all be represented. So let me go back now to, um, what they're to what um, information I have from Karen and Lori Geist. Lori is the SLP on the team. So they have a current set that have go, like, not, do, don't as one symbol, finished, help, it, there's your pronoun, make, more, open, out, turn. The ones that are in red are verbs. Um, the ones that, uh, no, and I'm going to go to the next thing in just a minute. So th 3D, I'm uh, getting ahead of myself. 3D tactual symbols, they're designed to fit in the hand of a small child. So Karen said, told me that it, they designed them with a four or five-year-old child in mind, and they each have a unique um, configuration of a raised element to indicate the particular meaning of that, the printed word in Braille, and they also have handles built into them. All right. Um, I'm going to show you them in a minute, but let's just talk about, well, maybe I'll show you now and we'll talk about them in a minute. All right, so let's see if this works where it's supposed to. Boom, boom, boom. I want to run that program. All right, so here they are. I have um, the symbol of like, and I'm, hopefully you can see that. Um, you can see it's got the word like. It's a triangle because it's a verb. Um, it's red. Um, and verbs are also red. It has Braille here. It has particular um, 
meaning on the outside. So all of the, the whole way it's set up has meaning um, and, and shares different elements of, of semantic um, meaning about what the, the symbol or the word like, how the word like is represented by this textual symbol. So that's like. Um, it. It is a pronoun. Pronouns are white. You can see this, the print is there. The print is there for us because we just, we need to understand what this is. Um, the Braille is there because they are presuming competence and presuming that now these kids may not be Braille users yet, but the same way that you put print on um, the, the symbols for kids that are, need pictographic symbols, they, we, they have decided and as a, a logical and a, I, I should say a, a, a presumed competence decision that um, the Braille will be there, okay? So, and then the unique symbol for it is, is raised and available, okay? So that's kind of what they look like. I can go show, through and show all of them to you if you want, but let's continue on a little bit. Um, the benefits of these and why they're pretty exciting is that they are reproducible exactly. So again, I'm gonna go back to that camera. How am I gonna do this? Yeah. So one of the things that I have worried about um, with the, you know, the Texas School for the Blind Symbols, they tell you how to make them and that's great, but maybe let's go back in the slide a little bit. So they tell you um, that this is finished and this is help and this is more. But for our kids, if they're not exactly the same, if that is not exactly the same um, uh, question mark there, um, will they necessarily represent it, have it understood as the same symbol? So with these tactual symbols, um, the ability to reproduce them exactly as they are over and over and over again is thrilling to me. Um, so if I happen to lose the it symbol, um, or maybe my dog chewed it, although they're pretty hard, I don't think anybody could do anything with this, um, which is also good because our kids, you know our kids put things to mouths, so we want them to not be something that they're going to be choking on or being able to bite a piece off of. This can be produced and reproduced over and over and over again using the files that are on um, on uh, the Project Core um, website. Um, okay. They're relatively easy to produce. Um, and so I got these ones that I have printed at the down to, at the Edmonton Public Library. I also have found a printer that I can use um, at the university. Lots of people these days have 3D, 3D printers. The cost of, of printing them all at the library was 30 bucks, which is pretty cheap considering if we're talking about getting um, these symbols um, for uh, the other textual symbols in the, in the cost of um, hundreds of dollars. And the thing is, um, they, they, you know, the library was kind of confused by what I was asking. So we, if we did them in bulk, they would be less cost, you know, $30, right? Exactly. Um, and I think, um, I don't know, I'm working on some other ways to think about where we can get this, but it's not going to be very long be before 3D printers are as common as, um, as uh, printers, I don't think. So low cost, rel relatively easy to produce. The other thing that's really kind of fun about them, um, not fun, important perhaps, is that um, they don't have to be this size and they will, they will maintain their integrity. Just like you can change the shape of a, a visual symbol for a child um, you know, from really big to smaller. We could print these off at half size or a quarter size. Karen t was telling me about a young lady that, or a woman who's never been able to communicate with symbols before, who has the tactuals now and is beginning to use them. Um, and she has them sort of as a necklace around her neck in much smaller size. So, and, and actually, you know, look, I'm thinking, I want to get one of those. I'm going to get myself um, these symbols printed off in, I don't know, 10 tenth of the size and make myself a necklace. Um, but there she has them available. You know, of course, the necklace is the lanyard. The lanyard can, you know, we have to do all the safety things. But what a neat way for a young woman to carry around uh, visual symbols 
uh, tactual symbols that she can um, use, and that, uh, and most importantly, that others can use with her uh, because they they go with her, they belong, they travel with her. So um, as you can tell, I'm a little excited about these. Um, so. As Lori was explaining the rules that she says are current rules, and she, um, Lori Geist is, as I said, the um, SLP on the team, and um, right now they are um, discerning different uh, parts of speech with an, an adverb, which would be a circle. Um, so let me, let's see, I will show you this um, again, if I go back to my PIVO. So um, here we go. So. Um, more or not want, so you're you're an adverb. It's actually an oval, um, so she's not quite got it right. Um, but it has the bumps on the side, and it's now this would be one. This would be the the library didn't have yellow, um, uh, whatever they plastic um, when I asked them to do this, and because I wanted them to make sure that I had them um, soon. I said, okay, you can make them in gold, but I'm going to get another set printed out in the actual proper colors because, as Karen said, you know, we don't know that kids can't see um, some color, and we want to use every possibility um, of maybe they can. Why would we? Why would we not um, have them have vision or have color as a potential marker as well? So, they, so far, they've got uh, five colors, five parts of speech. Um, they have shapes that mark them, and then um, the edges are certain. So then they're going to be able to take these different components and put them together in new ways to add to uh, the symbols beyond the um, current um, 13 that they have. Okay, so that's how they work. Um, so how do you use them? I mean, you use them just the way you talk to um, um, just the way you would talk to kids. You actively and repeatedly link the symbol to the action or the word. When we talk to babies and we talk about a baby, and I thought one of the symbols that I didn't get printed out but that they have is up. And I think about all the time in a day that I would talk to my daughter about up. Oh, you're getting up. It's time to get up. That's, uh, I'll pick you up. You want to be picked up. Oh, let's put your arms up so that I can put on your shirt. So all of those repetitions with variety was or is what I think taught Megan to talk. I don't know, unless she's different from the rest of the world. Um, so imagine if you, or go. So one, one example that they gave me in terms of a, a script is, and they call it a core sandwich. So they have some scripts. I'd be happy to ch uh, share their scripts with you. I'm sure that they wouldn't mind. It's not anything very special. Well, actually, let's go to the script right now, and I'll show you what it looks like. So to teach the script, I'm calling it a script, they call it a sandwich, um, is, you know, you first of all recognize that an activity is going to be um, uh, going to be represented with go, that we're going to go somewhere, that something's going to be involved going. You put the tactile symbol for go in the student's right hand. Now, this is very scripted because they're doing research, which is great, and following a script is always good when you're doing research, in implementation with fidelity. Then they also, and I didn't get to this in the, the slide, they also, if sign uh, in the student's other hand, uh, the sign for um, that uh, that word, if the student has it, and to give again the same way that we want to give multiple means of representation to our typically developing language learners, we want to give kids lots of different ways to understand what this means. Um, then, once you get the go thing in the hands, you go and you start going, and then after a minute or so, you stop, and then you remove the go symbol, and then. Yeah, anyway, so you see how it, you see how they've got it all scripted, and again, they've got some of these if you want them. Um, student important. We're not expecting the student to ask to go. That's not the point here. The point here is just like you're talking to your child about going, 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 and all the times you use the word go before you expect them to say go back to you is the same way that we're going to be using and using and using and teaching these symbols to our kids um, with visual impairments and um, see an, uh, complex, uh, complex communication needs. So the idea with go how many times, repetition with variety, those of you who have heard Karen and um, also Linda talk about this, it gives us lots of chance to do this. 
Um, so Karen was saying a little bit how they came to the, the their research right now. With their research right now, they focused on first uh, three words uh, to start with some students with this. And part of that is also, I think, words to start with the adults in the room so they can get lots of, um, I will definitely share the sandwiches, you bet. And I think I'll share some sandwiches kind of as a template as well as the specific ones that they shared. Um, so here's Karen's rationale for these three words. You can use go, not, like, to refuse, to obtain engaging social interactions, to seek and share information. And she puts in bold letters, just those three. So to refuse, go away. But you don't have to say away. You can say go away, but you just say go. Um, not, not like, to obtain something like. Want is there, but you don't have to have it like. Um, social, oh, I like that. Um, social, go. Social, not go, not like. Um, sharing information, I like that thing that you just did. I not like it. So three, you know, I, I really hope they get all the, the 36 core very soon, but even to start talking and to focusing on introducing the concepts of these textual symbols, they've chosen these three words. And excitingly enough, they also shared with me, um, so this is Lori, this is Lori telling how they did it. Um, so uh, this is one student, she has her own generic sign across her chest for like, um, and she doesn't really do a standard sign. For 10 years, she hasn't been able to use, to learn to use that gesture for like. Um, but at the end of the school year, she did it when the team put the like symbol in her hand paired with something they knew she liked. So not only did she understand the meaning of that symbol, she also then was able to just, again, think about our typical developing kids. Receptive language first, expressive language comes. So we're thinking about really using these, modeling using these receptively for a long time. Anyway, so, um, so uh, oh, and I should read you the rest. I'm going to read you the rest from the, the email. Um, sorry, I was going to do that sneakily, but I won't be able to do it sneakily because you'll, all right, let me see. I hope I have Lori's email up still here. Where did she send all this? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, no, that's, yeah, okay. So, um, the sequence went like this. Recognize your pleasure, put the 3D-like symbol in her hand, use the hand, hand under hand, not hand over hand. Again, something that I hope lots of you have heard, that we don't put kids through things. We help them to do things, sign. Um, we discontinu discontinued the pleasurable experience, waited 30 seconds, repeat. On the third cycle, she, si she signed like when Karen put the symbol in her hand and everyone cheered. Now, what an exciting opportunity. This is a kid who has not done this, anything like this for 10 years. So I'm pretty, no wonder they all cheered. So pretty, um, pretty exciting uh, day and Karen's told me many more of these anecdotal um, stories. The trick, of course, is that they're still in the middle of their research, so they haven't published this yet, but I think it will be exciting. Um, again, for gesture for go, move her hand forward, so they did the go symbol, and go is one that I often really um, encourage people to think about for kids because you can, like like up you can use go a gazillion times a day because you're always going somewhere or not going or go faster so all right so that's in a uh, I guess in a nutshell um, the core vocabulary and the 3D symbols that are available um, Lori asked me to that this is a work in progress, pretty early days in this research and this development, but I, for one, am pretty darn impressed with the possibilities for some of our most complicated kids um, and the possibility of the way that we can start to reshape and reimagine how we're engaging with them. So um, I've got about 10 minutes left. It's kind of hard to know. Uh, I can show you all the symbols if you want or if there's some comments or questions. Um, I'd be happy to um, take them now. So, Susan, where would you like me to go? Or anyone else? <laughs> I, I think showing a few more of the symbols because they are pretty, it is such a new concept. Sure. Okay. That so I like that idea. But other people, I've seen them a lot, so other people might have other ideas. There's a lot of comments okay, so about how expensive they are in some places. 
Oh, why would they be that expensive in some places? No, no, Grand Prairie, somebody just said that they spent $211 for 13 symbols. Oh, they shouldn't have. So, you know, let's that, let's try and figure out some places then. Did you, in Grand Prairie, did you print these symbols off? These particular ones from that site? I don't know. It's just on the chat window. If the Grand Prairie person wants to respond to that. That would be really helpful, please. And and if not, maybe send either Susan and I an email because that, that should not be the case. Um, we can certainly, I mean, um, Oh, okay, they were quoted the price. Okay, so, um, you know, let's, uh, I mean, that can be a follow-up from this as we try and find some places. As I said, I know for sure the Edmonton Public Library does it. I know for sure Cameron Library at the University of Alberta does it. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure that nobody's paying, that, you know, that, would, that would hurt Karen's heart and that would uh, take away some of the um, powerful thing about this yeah, Kelsey, do that. Say, yeah, never mind, that's too expensive. We can get them done somewhere else, for sure. You could have them done at Edmonton Public Library and have them shipped to Grand Prairie for <laughs> a heck of a lot less than that. So, yeah. Okay, so here's the symbol for open. And remember, the other piece I want to say, it doesn't matter. I mean, it could be... It could be anything. It does, it, like it makes sense. Okay, open. It makes sense to us that have symbolic representation and have language that it would be like that. But remember that we're teaching kids symbols, not expecting that they know them from the beginning, which is, I, I, in the whole AAC world, is really important. I wouldn't expect my child to know the word. Oh, well, first of all, the word open has nothing to do with an open space. It's just a word. So these symbols are just a word, but they have put some things, I guess, to make people kind of be more open to them. <laughs> open, huh? So this is what open looks like. There's the Braille, which means nothing to me, but there it is. The word in print, which means something to me. And then I would come to um, understand or know that this symbol um, represents the word open, uh, the concept open. So out, this is another one, and again, probably to, to make most people happy, they made it look like we would represent out. Um, but anyway, so this is what out looks like. Um, you can see that it's, uh, it's square, green, it goes, and I'm already forgetting all of their different little markers, but um, Okay, and finished, um, which is, um, uh, a, a, I have finished this. It is an adjective, I think, yeah, adjective. Goodness, I should know these things. Um, anyway, so adjectives are hearts, the blue, the print is there, or the braille is there, the print is there, and then this is the, the tactile marker that will indicate to the child what that symbol is. More, there it is, okay. And not, so not more, um, I would um, like more, I would like more of it. So there's the symbol for it, we looked at that earlier. Um, make, which is same thing, it's a verb, there's the braille, there's the word, there's the little um, meaning marker on the top to make them understand that this is the symbol for make. Um, do, don't, so that's kind of related, okay. And turn, turn, my turn, your turn, turn it on, turn it up, turn it over, turn it around. So I am missing one, I think I'm missing more, and I don't know why, I don't know if I missed printing it or if, um, if I, I might have lost it already, so, but I'm going to get a, a few more sets printed, so um, we have some to, to show. So, other questions, comments? Okay, Chris, I can, uh, let me see. I saw that, that you had something in the chat. Um, Oh, um, I think the you would that's part of what's in the scripts, 
but remembering that they have lots more um, I think there is a way, you know, there, there's an op to them, I think, but remember that you're putting them in the hands so the child gets the whole um, whole thing, thing or are you saying presented so the kids can start to make choices after they understood them and actually express things? Yeah, and I think we have to think about that. So that would be, I would suggest, probably thinking um, something like a, a core board, but again, that would have to depend on uh -huh. how the child uh, can that, actually. That question access. went straight to you, and people are asking if you could repeat oh, the question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, so Chris Chrysler asked any discussion around positioning concerns. So, if they were used in, to be used as an expressive communication tool, which hopefully long term they would be. That's not our first primary concern, we would want them to uh, be able to be found, I think, he, so he says consistently presented. And I think, um, I think that um, we would um, want them to be um, stored in a consistent mean, manner. So if the kids have them on a lanyard around them, we'd want them to always be in that same order, the same way that the 40 core that Karen talks about are always in the same order. If we stored them perhaps on a I, I'm sort of imagining for some kids, they might they might could be stored on a display kind of, so that they'd always be consistently there, sort of like um, a bigger ver. And if we get the symbols smaller, a version of the, the the way the 40 core are displayed. So I think we're about, um, you know, I agree with your point, Chris, is that we want to not just have them randomly flying in and flying out. Um, we want them to be presented in the same order or the same way all the time, just like they are in the in the other core vocabulary. And Judy, yeah, the student said, don't wish to hold them. I think what you do is you you know just um, hold their hands over them. Um, I think you know this is going to be one of the things that we we have to play with is new days. How can for kids who are tact tactile defensive, what are we going to do about that? Um, maybe they don't want to even touch them. We're going to have to think about some of that problem solving around those individual kids. And um, I think you and I are going to be doing some of that together. So that will be fun. But um, they, they don't have to hold them. They only have to get you know, contact with them enough to eventually get the, what they represent, the word that they represent. So they don't have to hold them. But I, I hear your, what your concern is as well, for sure. Well, Any other I questions? Want to, because I want to be cognizant of time, um, Kath, yep. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there. And I know Susan wants to say something real quick. Okay. Thank you so much, Kathy. This is really, I think, the beginning of an exciting new way to look at communication for some of our really challenge students who are blind and visually impaired. And um, hopefully we'll continue to work on this project and be able to report more uh, work back to the, the PLC members. So thank you so much for today and for sharing this information with us. And you did a lot of talking. You did a great job. Thank you. Oh, I can talk, Susan. You know that. <laughs> and just a reminder um, yeah. to everyone that uh, this was recorded, um, and it will be up on somewhere in the ERLC archives, um, hopefully within about a week or so. It's just like I said, some of the logistical stuff we need to figure out. With that, I'm um, going to... Ross, wait, 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 there's a question here. Yeah, there's a question about the Prologo, um, this, the new... Uh, the core board that I took around at the symposium uh, from assistiveware. So I contacted assistiveware and they will be making that core board available for printing. Lots of people aren't going to know what this means, but I will I will send out uh, information to um, the the uh, um, PLC about this. Um, the the trick is it's it's not going to be able to be purchased with that lovely laminate way that I showed you, but at least it will be available for um, um, uh, a download and printing. So thanks for that, and I will make sure to send that out to everyone in the CCN world anyway. So thanks. Yep. Perfect. Thank you so much. So. Every